But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, Let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Verse 5 is one of those verses that could be used by five-point Calvinists to prove that the Lord is responsible for everything, including sin. What Paul is saying is, if my wrongdoing, my badness, demonstrates God's goodness, doesn't God owe it to me to let me get away with it? After all, back in Psalm chapter 51, verse 4, David said against thee, Thee only have I sinned, that thou mightest be justified. The verse implies that David sinned in order to prove that God was right. If God gets glory when we sin, is he unfair for punishing sin? Of course not. That's the kind of question which a sinner who is trying to justify his divinement would ask. That's why Paul said, I speak as a man. No Christian who believes what God said and loves the Lord and is trying to please him is going to ask a question like that. A real Christian, not just a saved sinner, but the disciple of Christ, is not going to try to justify his sin and accuse God of wrongdoing when he gets what, what's coming to him for his sins. He might cry out for mercy and shed many a tear over the consequences of his sin, but he is not going to act like a queer in a cape pride, parade and strut his wickedness before the world. God never made any man to sin, James chapter 1 verses 13 to 14, and the Lord gets no pleasure out of sending a man to hell, Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 23 and 32. It's not his will, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. Nevertheless, the Lord will collect the glory to him, even out of sin and hell. We should glorify God by our obedience, not by our disobedience. Like I said, he will get glory either way. Your disobedience brings glory to God by contrast. People can see how good God is compared to how wicked you are, and his goodness and greatness are magnified. But we should glorify God by imitation ra rather than contrast. The way to bring glory to God is by lining up with the way he would do things. That is a much better way than being as rotten as we can be, so people will see how good he is. When the sinner sees a changed life, he can't help but acknowledge that God has been working in you. Nearly every time Christ or one of the apostles confronts some demon-possessed person in the New Testament, the devil in that person publicly acknowledges Jesus Christ as God and the Son of God, Mark chapter 5, verse 7, Acts chapter 16, verse 17. Do you know how the Lord responded to that? I mean, that is what they are supposed to do, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. Right. But here on this earth, in front of the lost he shut them up, Mark chapter 1, verse 34. He did that, and among other things, because he doesn't need nor want a devil testifying for him. He doesn't need nor want that kind of glory now. He wants his disciples to speak up and glorify him before a lost word by their testimony, backed up by a clean life. Do you know what God will do to a fellow who lives a wicked life? and yet still tries to justify his sins by claiming God can still get the glory. The Lord will judge him and take vengeance on him. That's what he will do. When he does, he will be perfectly just in doing so. But that is not how the Lord wants to get glory from a man. What God wants from you is obedience. In that way, God will accept what you do and bless you for it. The Lord prefers the glory he gets from an obedient life as opposed to the glory he gets from a disobedient life. Verse 7, For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? Obviously the supposition is not true. 
The truth of God doesn't abound more through your lies and your wickedness than by your obedience. Otherwise, the Lord wouldn't judge you. The fact that the Lord judges you and takes vengeance, verse 5, shows you that you are not to glorify him by contrast. Now, there are two groups associated with verse 8. Those who actually teach, let us do evil that good may come, and those who are slanderously reported to teach it. Verse 8. Those who teach the former are not Bible-believing people. The Roman Catholic Church allows its members to operate under mental reservations. That is, one of their members can be on the stand in court and lie under oath if he believes it will glorify God. Back during the Middle Ages, the Church taught and practiced that converts could be made, a, made at sword point and gun point as long as members were added to the one true Church. If Catholics could get away with it, with it, they would continue to do the same thing today. The fact that they don't is because they teach that compromise with anything or anyone is perfectly all right as long as the church survives. After all, if the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, Matthew chapter 16 verse 18, that's the verse they claim. The worst possible thing for the Catholic Church would be for it to fold completely up. So anything to keep it going is legitimate. Islam is identical. The group in the Catholic Church that teaches all of those things are the Jesuits. The doctrine of the Jesuits is the end justifies the means. In other words, it's perfectly all right to lie, kill, steal, commit adultery and fornication, anything as long as God gets the glory. The outstanding case of this happened during World War II. Hitler moved down into the Balkans and killed the Chancellor of Austria, Dolfus. He then put Susnik in a concentration camp for the duration of the war. When he came down into Yugoslavia, the Italian Pope saw the chance to restore the Habsburg monarchy to Austria and revive the Holy Roman Empire in Europe. So the Pope signed a contract, concordat, with Hitler, making him the official defender of the Roman Catholic Church in Europe. The Vatican acknowledged Hitler's drive for conquest as a holy crusade, so-called, and all the bishops and priests in Yugoslavia got behind him. In Yugoslavia there are two peoples, Croats and Serbians, the Croatians are Roman Catholic and the Serbians are Greek Orthodox. The Catholic cross Croatian rose up with Hitler's fascist armies and began to kill the Serbians, who were against Hitler. During Hitler's occupation in Yugoslavia, the Croatians had their way with Serbia for three years. In those three years, the Croatians had murdered by knives, clubs and guns over 200,000 Serbian Orthodox. The Catholics took, took the Serbians' children and put them in monasteries. They confiscated the Serbians' property. They banished the Serbians, and any Serbians who rem remained were forced to be baptized Roman Catholics. You will find the documentation for those facts in two books available. Uh, the Vatican Holocaust by Avram Manhattan and Hitler's Pope by John Cornwell. Pope Pius... Uh, 12th was well informed by the leadership of the Croat Church, and in correspondence to those leaders, he rejoiced over the increased membership of the Church in Croatia and Serbia. All of that mess was considered appropriate because, first, God received glory, and second, the Church grew in members. The fact that it was accomplished by mutilations, murders, torture and rape, just like in Fox, Fox's book of Martyrs and in the book Martyrs Miro, meant nothing at all. All of that happened in 1940 to 1941, not in 1400, 1500. If you think all of that ended with World War II, remember that NATO bombed Serbia in 1999 to protect Catholic Croatians from ethnic cleansing by Orthodox Serbians who were trying to assure, after the breakup of communist Yugoslavia, that Holy Mother Church 
wouldn't get another chance to murder almost a quarter of a million of its citizens. Apparently the Roman Catholic Church doesn't mind dishing it out, but it can't tolerate taking it. The Church doesn't believe that it should have to reap what it sows. We will look more closely at the doctrine of, of eternal security when we get to Romans chapter 8. A Bible-believing Christian believes that you reserve, receive salvation not because of anything you have done, but because of what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. If it wasn't yours to earn, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 9, then it's not yours to keep, Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. But that is by no means a license for a Christian to sin. The Lord will take vengeance on a Christian for his sin, just the same as a lost person, verse 5. He just won't send him to hell. A sinning Christian can lose his fellowship, 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. His testimony, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 to 13. Genesis chapter 19, verse 14. And compare 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. He can lose his service, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. His rewards, 2 John verse 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 15. His health, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 29 to 30. And even his physical life, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 30 and chapter 5 verse 5. But never his salvation.